Psalm 50, 15 says, Call on me when you are in trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. Matthew 11, 28, Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. James 5, 15, The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will restore him to health. God will rescue, recover, and restore. Hello and welcome to the Faith Alive Show. My name is Jamie and I will be your host. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Sometimes that scripture is easier said than done. On today's episode, Pastor Brent is going to talk about how we need to respond to the Word of God and believe that we are going to see the result that we want to see. He's also going to be finishing his series called Don't Be Silent. So stay tuned and have the Word of God bring life to you. Let's go. To, let's keep reading here. So it says here, uh, verse 6, you rejoice in this. Say rejoice. You rejoice. Hallelujah. We're supposed to rejoice today. We celebrated. Why? We have an inheritance. It's waiting for me. It's uncorrupted. It's waiting. Hallelujah. Thank you for salvation. We should come to church and rejoice. Should be a celebration time. Most people don't come here to celebrate. They come here to moan. A lot of people come here to find somebody they can tell all their problems to. No, we don't want that. We want you to come in here and celebrate. Thank God for what he's done. Hallelujah. Let's start rejoicing. Yes, I know it's not in your nature because we're still struggling with our flesh and our carnality. But you know what? We're called to step past that and start getting into what God says to do. And he says, you rejoice. Well, what's rejoicing? We don't use these words today. When was the last time you said rejoice? When was the last time your kids were having trouble? You said, come on, stop that. Begin rejoicing. <laughs> Anybody do that? Or say, here's a popsicle instead. No. Start rejoicing. You're like, what's that? See, we don't rejoice. We don't even know what it is. So we're supposed to rejoice. Is you rejoice in this. Hallelujah. Rejoicing to me means words. I've never rejoiced silently. How many of you rejoiced silently? When the Saskatchewan Rough Riders score a big, when they won the Grey Cup last year, you were watching, did you rejoice silently? Anybody rejoice silently? If somebody was to come and give you a million bucks right now, would you rejoice silently? Hmm. Hmm. Anybody? Have you ever seen a small child rejoice silently? And you give them a popsicle, they're excited, they're happy, they're, give them a banana, give them anything, you know, they're happy. Come on, they don't know the meaning of silence. And they're not supposed to. Not really supposed to. They're not really supposed to. It says here, so, uh, oh, you rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have to be distressed by various trials. So now we're going to have, we have some trials coming our way. We're all going to go through trials. Turn to someone and say, you're going to go through trial. It means it's going to be harder than, you, harder than you thought. Harder than you thought. Harder than you thought. Harder than you thought. Some of you are having a harder time in Christianity than you thought. And you are distressed by it. And you don't know why. And you're unhappy because of it. But you're not getting the point. The point is, is the enemy wants to make you unhappy. He's trying to give you distress. His whole purpose is to get you off your game. So if you're unhappy and you, and you don't know it, but your face surely shows it, right? <laughs> we all know it but you because you don't understand. Christianity is not supposed to make you happy. It's supposed to make you distressed. Because you're, you now have an enemy. You never had one before. Hallelujah. In the world, you were good. You didn't have one. Now you got an enemy. He's silent. He's invisible. He's subtle. He's smart. He's got you wrapped up. You don't even know it. And you're unhappy and you're blaming the church. You're blaming God. You're blaming the world. You're blaming, well, not the world, blaming the Bible. You're blaming somebody, everybody but the wrong person. You and the devil. You got to realize you're in trouble. 
When you get distressed, that's why you're supposed to rejoice when you get distressed. Hallelujah. I know I'm doing something right. God's in my life. Hallelujah. I'm serving the right God. Glory to God. So what am I supposed to do when I'm distressed? Try and figure it all out? No, you can't figure the devil out. You can't figure this out. You just start praising God. You just start rejoicing. You start dancing. You start shouting. You start speaking the word of God. You start standing up. You start speaking up. Hallelujah. You don't sit there and whine about it, mope about it. You don't get depressed about it. You don't get antidepressant drugs. You start standing up for yourself. Stand up for God. Stand up for what's right. Start speaking the word of God. Start getting up. Stand up. When you get down, speak up. Man on the street. Pastor Brent's message is about praying in a time of crisis. So we're going to go to the street to find out if people still pray to God. How do you react in a crisis and what do you do? Uh, I run. Scream. Uh, run away? Run? So how do you react in a crisis? What do you do? I pray. React in a crisis? Exactly what I'm doing right now. I just don't say anything. <laughs> yep. Keep okay. it quiet. Keep it silent. I usually panic. Okay. Uh, like so kind of you just lost your job and your girl's kicking you out the house and, you know, you just rear-ended somebody and you don't have any insurance. That's happened and I'm usually pretty calm. Usually pretty calm. I can figure it out. How do you react in a crisis? What do you do? Uh, I probably panic for the first 10 seconds. Then I take a few deep breaths and think about the most uh, smart move, I guess. Something like that. So where do you turn for help? Uh, her, <laughs> usually, or my mom. To God and my husband. Myself. <laughs> More of an independent kind of person, yeah. Where do you turn for help? My family. Okay. Yep. Where do I turn for help? Myself. I don't have a lot of outside help. Jesus. You're not reading the other side of this paper, are you? No. Okay. My mom. <laughs> mm, probably the police, if I had a chance, or someone that could probably help. My grandma. That one. Where do I turn for help? Um, probably like my sister. Um, she's pretty smart. She's smarter than me, so. Everybody I know is smarter than me, so. So does God answer prayer? No, no. no? Okay. Actually, uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I believe in a spiritual higher power, but not in God per se, like the Bible. And... Um, I personally don't believe, but I do respect people who do. I do not believe in God. Does God answer prayer? Yes. Uh, so could you give me a real quick example? Okay, um, there's a situation with work, um, my husband prayed and prayed and prayed, we both prayed and God answered our prayer by sending him to a workplace where he's happy and where he's not, where he's being treated good. That's awesome. Does God answer prayer? To those who ask. In some occasion. <laughs> so does God answer prayer? I don't think so, no. Why not? Uh, I think he, maybe he listens to them, or she, but I don't think directly he or she answers them. I think maybe just, you know... Maybe he works through, them. maybe works through people? Maybe, exactly. Like your smart sister? Exactly. Alright. Does God answer prayer? I, I wouldn't know at this point in time. So when Elijah was battling the prophets of Baal, what did he pray would fall down from heaven? The plague? Rain? Be great if I read the Bible, I suppose. Oh, uh, insects. No. Is it insects? I don't know. <laughs> that might be a different story. Tra it's not the man, Grass that's Moses, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I'll paint the scene. So he's in a battle, he's fighting some dudes. He wants to pray something down, something like that's going to give him the advantage. What would it be? Rain? Doritos? I don't know. Nice. What did you say? Doritos. I don't know, like a sword or something? <laughs> When Elijah was battling the prophets of Baal, what did he pray would fall from heaven? No pressure. Fire. Bam! That's what I'm talking about. First guy of the night, up there. My brother. Let's go back to the sermon. Now it says here, uh, for a short time, say short time. 
It's a short time, right? You know why it's short? Because when you start praising God, it goes away. It's not short because you're on this world a short time. Because the world, being in this world feels like a long time. Those of you that are married and you're married to someone that's real hard to get along with, it don't feel like a short time, does it? And it ain't get better. It says you had to be distressed by various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, say genuine. You know, there's no other better test of your faith to be genuine than when a trial comes upon you. When it gets hard and you don't like this and this and that. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's your faith is being tested. Amen? But it's a wonderful thing in God's eyes because it says here, it's more valuable than gold which perishes, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus. How many of you know that when you keep your faith... When Jesus comes back one day or you go up there or whatever it is, you know what? If you've kept your faith, it's going to bring praise, honor, and glory to Jesus. But if you have not kept your faith, then it brings dishonor, no glory, and shame upon Jesus. This isn't for everybody just because it's written here. You don't bring glory and honor and and praise to God just because you're sitting there as a Christian. Because you said a prayer 10 years ago. Come on. It says the genuineness of your faith. So you've got to prove the genuineness of your faith. Come on, you guys hear me today? So what do you do when you're struggling? I'm struggling. What are you supposed to do? Pray. You have faith. You have faith in God that he can help you. How many of you have faith in God that he can help you? Well, I don't know if he can help you apart from your prayer. I don't find any here that he's just going to come and help you just because you exist. I believe you need to respond. You have to respond to the word of God. If he tells you if you're suffering or afflicted, having troubles, pray. You say, well, I don't like that scripture. Well, who cares if you like that scripture? God never wrote it because you liked it or disliked it. He wrote it because that's what it is. And he said, do it. And if you do it, good things will happen to you. So when you're not having a great day, you're supposed to start what? Praying, talking to God, start confessing the word of God. I guarantee as soon as you start praying, and it it happens to me, I'll start praying, I'll start whining, I'll start moping, I'll start whatever, because that's how my prayers all start, and whatever. But you know what? As soon as I do it, and I start talking to God, and talking to God, all of a sudden stuff in here starts to come out. So the Holy Spirit grabs scriptures and starts throwing them out of me. Throws them out of me. Starts throwing them out of me. I don't, that's not what I, well, I did say what I want. But you know what? God never lets you hang there. He never lets you stay there. If you start praying and you really start seeking God, guaranteed something's going to change. And you know what? Your answer might not come right now. It might not fall out of the ceiling. Money might not just drop in there. Things might not change. But you know what? You start changing. We've all heard the old thing, prayer changes me, not God. Isn't that true? And it does. But you've got to do it to do it. Right? You've got to start speaking up. And pretty soon I'm quoting scriptures and praying and telling God how great he is and he's my refuge and my strength and so on and so forth. And in 20 minutes or so, I'm a better person. I'm different. I'm happy. Yes, right. Hallelujah. 20 minutes ago, I was complaining about something or down about something or didn't like something. 20 minutes later, I'm a happy camper. Hallelujah. Let's have hot dogs. Come on, let's have a banner. Let's have a party. Let's rejoice. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. A lot of people struggle with the will of God. A lot of people are wondering, what is it that God wants to do with my life? What, is, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And, and as a pastor, I hear a lot of people come and they ask me, there's just an uncertainty in their life about uh, what's God's will. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, the second half of the verse, Paul says, this is the will of God for you. That's pretty amazing that there's actually a verse in the Bible that says this is God's will. If you do it, then you're doing God's will. What could this amazing thing be? And Paul says to pray without ceasing. You mean if we just pray all the time, then we're doing God's will. That's what the Bible says. And that's an amazing thought because when I was growing up, a lot of people used to say, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. Kind of like if praying is the last resort. You know, we've tried everything else, so I guess all we can do now is pray. And that's kind of how I was brought up to think about prayer. 
But Paul says, pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. That's a different way of looking at it. And then he goes as far as to say, this is the will of God for your life. So I think when we think about prayer, we shouldn't think so much about those special times. I mean, there are special times with God, but we should think more about just this constant conversation with God, bringing everything to him in prayer. And this is a truth worth sharing. Let's go back to the sermon. It says, you love him though you have not seen him. I love that scripture. You love him though you have not seen him. What's the proof of genuine faith? Come on, genuine faith is proved out by your love for him when you can't see him. That means you're doing something that shows your love for God even though he's not here. That's called faith. So a lot of people aren't doing that. When they're having a rough time or they don't like something or are unhappy as a Christian, they're not loving God. They're not loving God. They're trying to get out of God. They're trying to get out of church. They're trying to get out of Christianity. They're trying to do something else. That's not proving the genuineness of your faith. That means that Christianity doesn't become a hot potato when you're not having fun. You don't pass it to the next guy. You don't jump into another chair. It is what it is. And I'm not going to try and get out of it. I'm not trying to run away from it. I'm not trying to get something from somebody else. I'm going to say, I love God even though I can't see you. Even though it doesn't look good right now, I'm going to love you, Lord. Yes. Right? You love him even though you don't see him. Yes. I guarantee you when you see him, you'll love him. Oh, i got to love him. No, but he's looking for people who will love him when they don't see him. Will you praise him now? Will you rejoice now? Will you worship now? Will you obey God now? Or do you have to wait till all the stars are aligned? The eternal eclipse has come. No. I'm, I'm not waiting for that. I'm going to do it even though I don't see him. I'm going to love him. And how do you love him? You keep his commandments. You do what he says. So if he says pray when you're down, by gosh, I'm going to pray when I'm down. And when I'm cheerful, I'm going to sing. It might not sound that good to you, but I am going to sing. How many of you sing in your house this last week? Not many. I bet not many. Because we don't sing much. We may not like the sound of our own voice, but God likes to hear your voice. Come on. God likes to hear your voice. The devil does not like the sound of your voice in praise and honor and glory and rejoicing. But he likes to hear it when you're down and when you're negative and when you're talking bad about everybody and when you're critical and when you're stubborn. He loves to hear those things. Psalm 91 verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my everything. Say, I will say of the Lord. I will say of the Lord. Say, I will say. Say it again. I will say. I will say. What does it say? I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my strength, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. And I love that. It says, I will say to the Lord. Some say, I will say of the Lord, but I say both. I say of the Lord. I say to the Lord. I will look to God and say, I say, you are my strength. You are my fortress. And it's amazing how many scriptures come out. All of a sudden, his greatness is being extolled. That's what Daniel did. That's what David did. That's what Jehoshaphat did. That's what many of the guys of the Old Testament who did this, they began to confess and the word of God would come and the truth about God would come and they would do it naturally. They would do it normally. They didn't have a sheet of paper with a bunch of confessions on it. It just came from their hearts, came out of what they've heard, came out of what they read, came out of what they knew. And next thing you know, they're praising God. When their bad times come, there's armies camped around again them, they begin to praise God, speak good things. God, you are great. You are good. You are our refuge. You are my strength in times of trouble. You are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? You are my fortress. You are my shield. You are my buckler. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. My God is for me. Who can be against me? 
There's nothing too difficult for my God. Is there anything too hard for Jesus? Is there anything too hard for me? No. These things start coming out and you start refreshing yourself, strengthening yourself. And God starts to come on the scene. And He becomes the one who loves me. He becomes the one who guards me. He becomes the one who protects me. Hallelujah. And I start raise, rising up. Because He takes you up. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Alleluia Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh praise Him Oh praise Him going to be sharing my salvation testimony with you today. I grew up in a home where I knew my parents loved me and wanted me to do well. We grew up learning a lot about God, about the rules of God, the things that we shouldn't do, mostly the things that we shouldn't do, not so much the things we should do, but mostly the things that they felt would be against God. We were trained and taught that we needed to honor, respect, and fear God, which I am actually very thankful to, for because it did teach us uh, some really good principles as far as how to honor and respect Him, honor and respect people too. It wasn't until I met my husband at the age of 15 that a lot of these beliefs that I grew up with were challenged. He had this personal relationship with God that I didn't have. And it became very evident that I didn't have it. He would read the Word, he would talk about the Word, he would, he would talk about God, he would, with passion and with excitement. And to me, that just seemed strange. And so as he would continue to do this through the years, through our dating years, 
it uh, became apparent to me that I was missing something and that there was something that I needed that he had. And so he would continue to sow those seeds into my heart and into my life, and I would continue to question what it truly meant to serve God. I believe it was actually through him that led me to Jesus. It wasn't him personally that prayed the prayer with me, but it was because of his words and because of his time that I uh, received Jesus. It wasn't until I was 17, went to a youth camp, a lady came to me and she asked me if I had received Jesus as my personal savior. And I said, no, I did not. And so she asked me if I would like to receive Jesus as my personal savior. And uh, I did. I knew from that day that my life had changed, that things were gonna be different, but I had no idea how different they would actually be. God has been so faithful. He's become very personal. He's become very uh, a part of me. He's been, he's caused uh, me to walk in strength and be able to walk in joy. And he's given me such great courage. The enemy often likes to try to take this out and he knows our weak areas, but God strengthens us. And he's been so faithful to me through these years and to our family and uh, I love him and I appreciate everything he's done for me and I just thank God that he is in my life and that I can serve him and honor him and continue to uh, encourage others as well. Why don't you pray with me so your life can change? Pray this after me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you say the prayer today? We would love to hear from you. Our phone number is 306-652-2230. Or you can email us at info at fafc.ca. Wasn't that a great show? So now we know that when trials come our way, we need to pray to God and rejoice in the Lord at all times. Thanks for watching the Faith Alive show, and remember, don't be silent. Do you have a testimony or prayer request? Would you like to contact us? Our mailing address is 637 University Drive, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, postal code S7M, 0H8. We look forward to hearing from you soon. With me, and you'll recover your life. James 5.15 The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will restore him to health. God will rescue, recover, and restore.